Um, I'm delighted to um, welcome you to today's seminar uh, sponsored by the Buxbaum Institute, which was created in 2011 with a gift from Matthew and Carolyn Buxbaum Foundation. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Gretchen Schwarzy. Uh, Gretchen is a friend and a former colleague here um, at the university. Um, Gretchen received her medical degree from the Harvard Medical School and a master's degree in public policy from the Go John Kennedy School of Government. Am I all right? Okay. Oh, go oh thank you. Thank you. Um, Gretchen completed her residency at the Mass General and her fellowship training in vascular surgery and clinical ethics was done here at the University of Chicago. Uh, Dr. Schwarzy is an associate professor in the Division of Vascular Surgery at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine. Um, Dr. Schwarzy has a secondary appointment at Wisconsin in the Department of Medical History and Bioethics, a very old and well-known Department of Bioethics in the country. As a board-certified vascular surgeon and medical ethicist, Dr. Schwarzy is a nationally recognized expert in surgical decision-making, informed consent, advanced directives, and end-of-life care. Dr. Schwarzy's research, which is funded by the Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute, PCORI, and the NIH, um, currently um, Dr. Schwarzy is focusing on improving communication between patients and their surgeons so that patients can avoid unwanted treatment and make decisions that align with the patient's values, preferences, and goals. Uh, Dr. Schwarzy is an alumna of the Greenwall Faculty Scholars Program, a very distinguished program, um, uh, perhaps uh, the premier uh, bioethics scholars program in the country, and currently holds a KL2 award uh, through the University of Wisconsin CTSA and a GEMSTAR award from the American Geriatric Society. Um, and these awards were given to test a communication intervention for older, frail surgical patients. Today, as you can see behind me, Dr. Schwarzy will speak on the topic, um, can a communication tool for surgeons reduce unwanted care, a proof of concept. Please join me in welcoming our old colleague and friend, Dr. Gretchen Schwarzy, back to the university. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. It's really extraordinary to be here and see so many old friends. I have to tell you, when I finished vascular fellowship here, it was actually only a one-year program, and my husband had two more years of residency. So I interviewed in the community for um, general vascular surgery jobs. I went out to Naperville and uh, Roslindale, and they looked at my CV and looked at me, and they were like, what are you doing here? Why, why do you want a job like this? Don't you want to be an academic surgeon? And I thought, no, I don't like pipettes and mouse models and all that stuff. And um, so I came back and talked to Bruce Quartz about it. And I said, Bruce, you know, nobody seems to want me. I can't figure out what to do. And Bruce said, you know, there are a lot of good things to do in academic surgery. Why don't you just take this extra year of vascular fellowship that we just happen to have and figure out something for you? And um, it actually gave me the opportunity to do this clinical ethics fellowship and really changed my life, uh, thanks to Mark and Bruce. Bruce, so um, it was a huge, um, uh, it, you know, huge opportunity to move forward in a very different direction because I thought the only way you could be in academic surgery was to pipette things. So, um, so here's my uh, current funding. I'm going to start with a little uh, story um, about a patient that one of my partners uh, took care of about three years ago. And this is a woman who was in her late 70s. She was about 79. And she was, for all intents and purposes, somebody we might describe as frail. She was sort of just making it at home. She had a walker, some pretty bad osteoarthritis. She also had some pretty significant COPD and was on home oxygen. 
In addition to this, her um, renal function wasn't particularly great. Um, her EGFR ran about 25 some days on a good day. Unfortunately, she showed up at our hospital with a tender thoracoabdominal aneurysm. And my partner very appropriately had a conversation with her and her family about surgery. And he quoted her a 50% uh, chance of dying from the operation. He said that she had a 80% chance of being on a ventilator for long term, and probably a 60% chance of needing dialysis after surgery. He also very appropriately proposed a palliative care option and said, you know, we could make sure that you are comfortable. And she and her family spent quite a bit of time thinking about what to do, and ultimately they decided to go forward with surgery. So the next day they went to the operating room, and you know, these are really big cases, and they operated for, I don't know, almost eight hours, probably closer to 10. They lost tons of blood. And in the end, she actually came off the table looking pretty good. The next day in the ICU, you can imagine just what she looked like. She was intubated. There's a whole roll of drips running behind her. She's making a little bit of urine. It was as best as you might hope for. She did pretty well. She wasn't on pressors. She wasn't requiring any more blood products. The surgery team came and rounded on her, and they were, they were pretty happy. A few hours later, her family came in, and they took one look at her with the breathing tube, all puffy, all of this life-supporting treatment. And they looked at the team taking care of her in the ICU, and they said, no, she would not have wanted this. This is not OK. You need to withdraw all of these things right now and let her go. So if I had to describe what happened to this patient, and if I had to use just one word, I would say this patient received unwanted care. That despite having a conversation with her surgeon, she ended up with treatments that she didn't want. And more and more we're hearing in the lay press stories about this unwanted care. And you know, these are all actually really great stories. And despite the fact that they have really bad titles, the stories that they, uh, they carry within them are really profound stories about treatments patients received that they didn't want, particularly around the end of life. And if I had to put my finger on what the problem is, I would say the problem is informed consent. That it has not evolved over time in a way that allows patients to anticipate what the effects of surgery are. And you can imagine how this family put it together. If she had a 50% chance of death from surgery, she had a 50% chance of surviving. If she had a 60% chance of renal failure, she had a 40% chance of not having renal failure. And if she had an 80% chance of prolonged mechanical ventilation, she had a 20% chance of not having prolonged mechanical ventilation. And they went down the list and said 50, 40, 20. She's got a 20% chance of being just like she was before surgery, when there's not a person in this room who thought she would be just like she was before surgery. And I worry that when we use language of informed consent like we've been taught to do, according to our current standards of care, we mislead people. We don't give patients the kind of information that they need in order to make decisions that are truly aligned with their values and goals. I would also say, and apart from the bioethicist who I hold responsible for some of this, I hold the surgeons responsible for this as well, that we've spent a lot of time developing really, really cool technology. I mean, I just love the endovascular aneurysm repair. That is awesome. Um, and all of these other amazing things that you can have, Cheney got his LVAD. I mean, it's great, the technology that we have uh, generated. But we have not spent any time innovating how we talk to patients about how to have these operations. And I think that's a failure both on the part of surgeons and on the bioethicists. So our group has worked really hard to try and think about solutions to this problem. And this is our intervention. It's called best case, worst case. And it has multiple different components. What I'm showing here is actually a graphic aid. It's a, you know, a cartoon graphic aid. But this is something the surgeon can do with a simple pen and paper diagram, drawing two lines, drawing stars and boxes, and small little notes to the family about what different outcomes look like. And then the surgeon uses narrative, tells a story about what outcomes might be possible. And the surgeon would say, in the best case scenario, if we choose to go for surgery, you will have an operation. And the operation will take eight to 10 hours. And after the operation, you'll be in intensive care 
with a breathing tube and a lot of life-supporting treatments. And if we're really lucky, in the best case scenario, maybe we can get you out of the ICU in three or four days. But you'll need to be in the hospital for several more days because this surgery is gonna take a lot out of you. And given what I know about you, that you were just barely making it at home given the fact that you had a lot of family support and this operation is a huge go, I don't see you getting back home after the hospital. So even in the best case scenario, I think you're gonna need to go to a nursing home after being in the hospital, and I think that's where you're gonna end up dying because you have a lot of medical problems, and this surgery is gonna take a lot out of you. And then the surgeon goes on to describe the worst case scenario, and it's really important to explain what that is because in the surgeon's mind, the worst case scenario is that the patient dies in the operating room. But honestly, for the patient, that is not so bad. You go to sleep, you never wake up, you don't have to make any choices, it's very painless. But we know that most people don't die in the operating room. And their worst case scenario is that they spend two or three weeks in the ICU with multiple complications. They never wake up and talk to their family. And at some point, their family has to decide what to do for them. And then you can say, now that I've given you the boundaries of what is possible, what the best case looks like, what the worst case looks like, let me tell you what I think is most likely. And this allows you to say to the patient, I know things about you that help me try to guess to the best of my ability where this might go. And you say, your kidney function's not so good. And you're really just getting around with a walker at home. So what I think is most likely is probably closer to worst case scenario. Yeah, we might get you out of the hospital, but given that you were sort of really failing at home before this all started, I don't think you're gonna live that much longer. And this is very different than using probabilities and statistics to try and explain what might happen with surgery. The other thing that best case, worst case does, it shows a clear alternative a second choice because oftentimes we talk about surgery and alternatives and usually we say oh well you could always not have surgery but that sounds so very secondary it doesn't sound like anything you want and so you can talk about what supportive palliative care would look like in the best case scenario we keep you comfortable and you have some time with your family and everybody can gather and come say goodbye and ideally you do the same thing on both sides so we had this idea that maybe if we train surgeons to use our tool called best case, worst case, we might be able to do a better job with preoperative decision making. I have to tell you that this is very different than what we've been using, and it's based on this thing called scenario planning, which is actually an incredibly interesting strategy that Pierre Wack, who was an economist for Shell Oil, um, used in the 1970s to help guide Shell Oil through the very turbulent times that they were facing. And economic predictions were much like the kind of statistics that we all use to talk to patients. And economic forecasting is known to be very fallible. And you can imagine if the price of oil oil was, you know, went up $2 last month and $4 this month, you put a whole bunch of factors together and you try to predict, well, there's a 50% chance that it might go up again next month. Well, that's not always accurate. And so what WAC did to talk to managers, so the economists make the forecast and then the managers make some decisions about how to, you know, whether to send boats out into certain paper places or buy more oil from here or start drilling there, was to use scenario planning and to use a whole bunch of different factors to not only sort of synthesize this uh, predictive information, but also to tell a story. To tell a story in the way that stretched the distance between what the forecaster knew and the inner reality of the decision maker, the manager. And it allowed the inner reality of the decision maker to start understanding how the, the world would play out in different scenarios. So we've used this strategy to generate our tool. And I think the two things that it does that, really, that I think are really nice is it puts limits around the boundaries of what is possible for patients, and it allows them to anticipate and imagine a new reality. And I think a lot of times when we're dealing particularly with old patients who are actually sort of making it at home, their old reality is pretty robust. And it is very hard for them to understand how an acute surgical problem is really gonna change their overall health. That is a very difficult thing to get in the moment and to be able to make decisions about. And so this allows, them, allows us to stretch that distance between this predictive stuff and their inner world of what their life is like. So, um, so this is our thing, tell a story, best case, worst case. 
And it fits into this model of shared decision making. And this is not to say that you should not do informed consent if you use best case, worst case, but that informed consent is a legal requirement and it's probably something you should talk about after you've made a decision because it's really just not that great for helping you make a decision. So we did a feasibility study at the, um, uh, in Madison. It was a RO3 funded study by the Institute for Aging. And we did a very simple pre-post study where we enrolled uh, 10 patients before the study. We audio recording these conversations between surgeons and patients. We then trained 25 surgeons at our hospital, including cardiothoracic, vascular, um, and acute care general surgery uh, surgeons. And then finally, we enrolled 20 patients afterwards. The patients had to be clinically frail by markers either that we could identify in the chart or or, uh, that the surgical team had uh, told us. And we had to enroll the patient in the study before the attending had had a conversation with the patient. In addition, the attending surgeon had to confirm that there was a choice that there was a choice that they could be made. And this may or may not have been a good study design decision, and we can talk a little bit about that. But I think it's important for understanding our data a little bit. So what outcomes were we looking at? We want to make sure that it was feasible. And I think you know this is the thing. We think the laparoscope, laparoscope is a great tool, but the laparoscope would be a really awful tool if surgeons couldn't learn to use it. And so when you're thinking about what your intervention is, your intervention is not the laparoscope. Your intervention is teaching surgeons to use the laparoscope. And so that's how we had to conceptualize this. If we couldn't teach surgeons to use our tool, the tool is completely useless. So our intervention was, was it feasible to train surgeons to do this? Was it acceptable to patients and their family? We used an objective measure of shared decision making, which means we had to observe the conversation, so we used audio recording. We did some qualitative analysis. And then we had a bunch of um, items that I thought were going to be really helpful in, in allowing us to judge the um, efficacy of our intervention, these impact of event scale and decisional conflict. And I'll talk a little bit about why they weren't so great. So um, you can see our patients were in general old. Um, many of them had a lot of comorbid conditions. Um, some of them had more than five. Um, we were able to enroll uh, patients from a range of different surgical practices and really a range of surgical decisions. Um, many of them died. Um, many of them had to go to a sniff afterwards. So our first uh, outcome that we we're really looking at, is it feasible? And the answer is yeah. Surgeons can do it. So at least we jumped that hurdle because that was probably the highest one. This is a, um, a graphic aid that one of my partners used to discuss with a 90-year-old gentleman uh, amputation versus hospice for four-foot sepsis. He was very frail and very sick. And you can see he says in the, in the best case scenario, if we do surgery, you'll be alive. You'll need a below knee amputation. You'll need to return to a nursing home. And um, he talked about life expectancy. Maybe you could get another year. He also brought up hospice, about how he'd be home with family and have pain medication. But he thought the lifespan of this patient was very limited if he chose hospice. <coughs> Um, the option five scoring actually worked very well. So this is a score generated by um, Glenn Elwin from Dartmouth. And this is a, um, a, a scoring system. It's based on a scale of zero to 100. And there are five different domains. And you get anywhere between zero and four for each domain. And then you multiply it. And you can see that option scores um, increased. And then the variability between the scores actually decreased as well. So we did make some, um, some objective improvements in shared decision making on this measure. Um, I have to tell you that if you've read other papers about shared decision making and you've seen option scores, surgeons do really well on this score. The people who are not surgeons tend to be down in the 10s to 20s at the most. And that's by and large because we use a lot of risk benefit language that you get a fair amount of credit for. Um, so um, who knew? Um, but that does make it harder to show that you're doing better. Um, so what did we see? We saw that we changed this conversation. And our qualitative analysis here was probably the most helpful thing. Before we, in our control group, before we um, trained surgeons to use this intervention, the surgeons talked about, this is your problem. 
and this is the operation I have to treat your problem. That is how the conversation started out. And even though the surgeons didn't necessarily recommend surgery or spent a lot of time talking about an alternative or why surgery might not be so great or how risky it was, the fact that they had started off with this is your problem and this is the solution I have really changed what the conversation was. And so with best case, worst case, they walked in and they said, today we have a choice. Let me tell you, we are going to need to decide between these two things. So that's kind of where I want to use this little diagram and go through the choices. I think that is a very different structuring of the conversation than to say, this is your problem and this is the treatment. They described the treatment out outcomes very differently. And you could see this um, before the surgeon's talking about, well, you know, the risk of intubation is probably 7 or 8 percent. And, you know, when you think about it, you're like, wow, is that helpful? But that's what we've been trained to do. That's how we speak. And after the intervention, they would talk about under the best of circumstances, that would be involved being in the hospital for a week or two weeks because of your age and the heart problems, that might be need being in the intensive care unit. I think that is a very different conception of what surgery is like and what the consequences of it are. I have to say, of the things that we were able to change, this is probably the thing I'm the most proud of, which is that some of our surgeons were able to take this description, explain it to the patients, then hear back from patients and families what was important to them, and make a strong recommendation. So this surgeon had a long conversation, um, actually, in the emergency room for a patient with a really bad colonic obstruction. And, um, the family was very clear about what was important to her, and the surgeon used that information after figuring this out using best case, worst case, to make a strong recommendation. This is what I know about her. She didn't want a lot of these interventions, and we're going to do a maximum amount of those things if we decide for surgery. So my general thought is that surgery where she ends up in a nursing home with complications from surgery is not something that she would ever have wanted. And I think when we talk about goals and values, you know, we all have this idea that we just need to have goal concordant care, and if you just ask patients what their values and goals are, you'll know what to do for them. But patients rarely come to conversations with preformed preferences. And when you ask them what are your goals, you often get a blank stare. And so what best case, worst case does is it sort of sh shows the range of options. It's like stories from a shelf. And then they can start to talk about it. Oh, intubation? That sounds really awful. Or oh, I could go home? That's really important to me. And it's a way that when you start to say to them, how are you thinking about this? What is important to you now? You're going to get a different kind of response than if you just sort of start by, what are your goals? Um, we went and interviewed patients and families about 30 to 120 days after this conversation that they had with the surgeon. Oftentimes, the um, patient either was really um, delirious at the time of uh, the conversation and really didn't rec remember it, and many of our patients had died. So we very purposely enrolled pa family members so that we could go and talk to the family members. And we would show up at their house, and without prompting, they would pull this graphic aid out of a drawer somewhere and say, you know when we were in the hospital, the surgeon used this, and it was really helpful. But in general, they really liked it. They thought it was helpful because it allowed them to ask questions, and that it enabled them to see um, some of the bad outcomes that, were ha that could happen. And even though many of the patients chose surgery, and they said that they were hoping for the best case scenario, they said, but we knew bad outcomes could happen, and we, it allowed us to prepare for that. So I think it was um, uh, very well tolerated from that standpoint by patients and families. We had um, a lovely 85-year-old priest who got in a terrible car wreck and also had metastatic pancreas cancer. And he was intubated in the ICU and very alert. And the trauma surgeon went through this with him, best case, worst case. She did it like three times and had the graphic aid. And ultimately, he decided that he did not want to be intubated. And he really wanted to switch to comfort-focused care. And when we went to interview his niece afterwards, she said, you know, I took this little diagram and I traveled around the country after my uncle died and I showed it to my family members to explain to them what happened and why we made the decisions that we did. So it allowed patients to tell their own story about what had happened by giving them the stories to do that. So I have to say, you know, it all sounds like really awesome. We changed the conversation and we have objective measures of shared decision making that certainly seem better. Um, Great, let's go. Let's just change the world. Um, I have to say there were some things that we really didn't expect that I'm now going to show you um, where we fell short. 
So um, when you think about the world of shared decision making and the people who try to intervene and improve decision making between patients and doctors, you hear a lot about decision aids. You hear a lot about choice. You hear a lot about ways to explain uh, decisions, risk, um, in pictographic ways, in patient-friendly ways. It really focuses on this sort of choice talk and description of options. That's how decision aids work. But the problem is that there is a lot more to shared decision making than just knowing that there's a choice and understanding the options. And we saw this very glaringly in our study. So the first is this idea of context, which is that if patients don't understand the gravity of their illness or what this conversation is about, it's really hard for them to move forward. So if I say, well, you have a choice between surgery and hospice, and they have no clue that they have a grave, uh, a grave illness or that their health condition has acutely changed, it's really hard for them to even consider hospice as an option when they don't understand the severity of their condition and what's going on. This idea about elicit, so now I'm on the other side of this box. So eliciting preferences, people talk about this all the time, but they don't actually give you a lot of skills to do this, and I think it's a lot harder than it looks. And we only had two hours to treat the, teach the surgeons, so we had to sort of limit what we taught them. And so we gave them phrases to encourage deliberation. What are you thinking? How do you think about this? Um, what's important to you now? And the surgeons were able to do that, but I'm gonna show you some, some data as to why that wasn't enough. And then finally, this issue of making a recommendation and we can talk about my disgruntlement with the bioethicists a little bit more here. So what's this issue of context? So all of these patients were frail and elderly. All of them had an acute surgical condition that, and faced very high mortality. None of our surgeons walked into the room and said, this is bad news. And the palliative care doctors get this. In fact, they recommend that you have two conversations. The first conversation, you go in and you say, this is bad news. And the second conversation, you go and have a goals of care conversation. Now, I think many times we don't have the luxury of doing that in surgery because it, the, treat, the condition is too acute. But I often think when we say we're going to have a goals of care conversation, what we mean is we need to go have a bad news conversation. And if you don't go in and say, I am sorry, but this surgical problem is bad news, it could change your life, and it may shorten your life even with surgery, it's very hard to understand the rest of that conversation. Um, this eliciting of preferences. So, so typically what happened is the surgeons did what we told them to do. And they'd say, what do you think about all this? What's important to you? And the patient would say, I just want to live. And the surgeon would go, great, let's have surgery. And you got no information about what that meant what it meant for the patient to live, and what health states might be unacceptable to the patient, even if the patient was still living. So if I say I just want to live, and I don't tell you, but I don't want to live on dialysis and on a ventilator in a nursing home, you actually haven't elicited my preferences. And we really found that um, as soon as the patient sort of expressed any sort of preference for anything, even something like just saying, oh, I want surgery, there was very little exploration of what that meant for the patient. And so they didn't really really gain information about the patients and uh, values and goals. And then this issue of recommendation. So um, yeah, I'm really dissing the bioethicists here, but I worry that in our desire to support patient autonomy, we have sent a message that it is incorrect or inappropriate to make a recommendation. And I think that the problem is that we are trying to support absolute autonomy, and really what we need to support is relative autonomy. And we, in practice with the surgeon, said, now you've heard the patient's goals, now you understand what they are. Your job is to make a recommendation that aligns with those goals. And the surgeon said, no, I cannot do that. My job is to offer, their job is to choose. If you ask me, that's abandoning the patient. And I think that this is a cultural problem that we're going to have to spend a long time overcoming. And um, you know, patients often say to us, what would you do if this was your father, or what would you recommend? And what they're asking us to do is give them a recommendation. And oftentimes we heard patients say that, and the physician said, well, you could just take, think about it. And I think we have this huge resistance to doing that, and that's going to be something that we're going to really have to work on to move forward here. So, so we did our best case, worst case 2.0. 
The other thing that we really had to think carefully about is um, how do we codify what we're doing? How do we explain what it is and what it isn't? And the problem with best case, worst case is, I mean, it's actually a blessing and a curse. It seems actually pretty easy to do. It's pretty hard to do. And um, that's harmful because people say, oh, I'm doing that now. I already do it. And I've tape recorded enough surgeons to know that you're not doing it. It really takes some practice and it's challenging. So we made this little whiteboard video. Um, you can Google it on YouTube, best case, worst case, whiteboard video. But we did it for two reasons. One was to make sure that we got these other elements in it. We have the breaking bad news. We decided that we were never going to have enough time to teach surgeons to elicit preferences and really do that is a difficult skill. It takes hours to learn and probably a lot of practice. So we changed the graphic to aid to have the surgeons write on the bottom after they wrote all this other stuff, what is important to you now. So at the very least, the patient and family could take it, hold on to it, and really think through what is valuable to them. And then finally, at the end of our video, we're very clear that it, you need to make a recommendation. This is part of what it is. And what we wanted to do is really codify what best case, worst case was and show people how to use the steps. So, um, so this is you know, nationally distributed at this point, and um, it's only 10 minutes. I don't know that it's enough to learn how to do best case, worst case, but I think at least it allows us to say, this is what it is. And if you're not doing this, then you're not doing it. So, um, so what do I think about this study? So I'm thrilled that we were able to teach surgeons to do it, and I'm thrilled that we were able to change the conversation. But what I really wanted to think through is how could we change health? This issue of one unwanted care, how can we change that? How can we make that outcome better? And the bottom line is that I can't do that in this cohort. And part of that is because it was a really, really hard study. It's very hard to enroll patients, sick old patients, in the hospital when they come in with an acute surgical problem. First of all, they're getting wheeled around the hospital all over the place for tests. They're really scared. And I get that. They have a right to be really scared. We had this really sweet 90-year-old lady who um, had a tender thoracoabdominal aneurysm. And my research assistant went up to her, and we have this nice little brochure be in our study. It's Dr. Schwarzy's study. She looks at the brochure, and she goes, oh, Dr. Schwarzy, I love Dr. Schwarzy. She came to our nursing home, and she gave us a lecture. She's great. My, you know, so of course, my research assistant pulls out the set consent form, and she wants her to be in our study. Oh, no, no, I couldn't. I'm way too stressed out. She wouldn't be in our study. I mean, it is really hard to enroll patients in this study. On top of that, you know, it took us about a year and a half to enroll 30 patients, and this is a wildly heterogeneous cohort. For some patients, surgery was absolutely the right choice for them, and for some patients, whatever the alternative was, was absolutely the right choice for them. I cannot add that up and say one was better than the other. Maybe they had more goal-concordant care, but I don't have a measure for that. There is no measure for goal-concordant care. So I don't know how to study this group in a way that allows me to say their health, health outcomes are better because we did best case, worst case. I kind of got set up with this idea of decisional conflict. If you look in the decision science literature, everybody loves decisional conflict. And if your decision aid's working well, you have really low decisional conflict, really low decisional regret. I have to tell you, we had no decisional conflict in the before or after. So five, 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 five. If you have no variability in your scale, you cannot measure a difference. So there was no way to measure whether decisional conflict got better because they just didn't have any to begin with. On top of that, philosophically, I have an issue with decisional conflict because I can make sure as a surgeon that you have no decisional conflict and yet you are not at all informed about surgery. And all I have to do is say, Mark, if you don't have this operation, you're going to die. And I promise you will not have any decisional conflict, but you're not particularly informed. And you may not have thought about the decision very well. So I'm not so sure it's such a great measure. And yet this is kind of what we have to say, oh, the decision support worked really well. The psychological stress is used a lot in the intensive care literature, and they tend to use a very homogeneous group that all dies. And that's helpful because you can imagine how much stress happens in a family member when somebody dies. But it is very hard to compare the stress of health and illness on a family member for patients who die 
and patients who don't die. So if you have a heterogeneous cohort where only a small percentage of them die, or even a big percentage, but not a huge percentage, like 90 or 100%, it's very hard to use IES as a measure that somehow you've reduced their stress. So when you look at the ICU literature, it's brilliant, but their patients are way sicker than this. And so, um, so I don't know what measure to use when some people are going to die and some people aren't going to die. And then finally, this issue, this um, intervention actually took a lot of resource, and that's because we did a one-to-one -one coaching with the surgeon. We used standardized patients with practice, and we scheduled it at the surgeon at a time that was convenient for the surgeon. And while probably 12 to 15 of our surgeons actually showed up to their session, the rest of them, 10 of them, not only did they cancel once, they canceled three, four, five times. And I totally get that. I know what it's like to be a surgeon and just try to get this case on and you don't have any time and you look on your schedule and you're like, oh, I could skip that. I get that. But it's really resource intensive and um, it's very hard to, sort of, to, to imagine doing this in a national way. So what to do next? Um, so I have some ideas. So the first idea is to change the cohort. That this heterogeneity and the acute care surgical patients, I just I can't get beyond that with this cohort. And so I have two new cohorts. One is uh, patients who are 75 and older who are considering, who have. Um, and stage renal disease and are considering a choice between dialysis and full supportive care. The nice thing about that is that you can be pretty agnostic about what they choose because the survival advantage of dialysis when you're that old is actually pretty limited. And they all have similar things. They're all 75, they all have renal failure, they're all facing the same decision, and they have a whole bunch of other stuff you can count. Did they have advanced care planning? How many times were they in the hospital? What did their intensive care unit needs uh, go for? And then they have lovely quality of life measures. So the end stage renal disease population looks much easier to study this um, intervention in. And so we have a grant from the National Palliative Care Research Center to do a pilot study with that right now. Um, I'm not a nephrologist though, and even though I am often putting fistulas in people who can't even lie flat for the procedure, um, I don't really, it's interesting, but I don't love the kidney patients the way I love my surgical patients. So I really wanted to find a surgical group to test this in, and so we have a R21 from aging to study this in um, elderly trauma patients. And I'm hoping that that group at least looks a little more homogeneous. Um, we did take a risk, and our health outcome is intensity of treatment versus how much palliative care did they receive. And I think that you could make an ethical argument that that's maybe not your right outcome, but that's the outcome we chose. And then another, um, and then it's really just hard for me to give up on these acute care surgical patients. I mean, these are my people and the patients I care about. And on top of that, I actually really care about the surgeons who are um, challenged with making these decisions because all of us face these decisions and it's really hard. So we've been thinking a lot about implementation and how to do that in a way that maintains the fidelity of our intervention because it's just not that easy. So the first thing is our YouTube video. Um, this technique is called scribology, and um, it actually was really hard to put together a 10-minute video. You can't imagine how much went into it, but you don't actually get to say that much in 10 minutes, and you really want to illustrate to somebody how to do things. So we've used our video to do that. Hi, I'm Toby Campbell, a palliative care doctor at the University of Wisconsin. I'm here to teach you how to use best case, worst case a communication tool developed by our research group to help surgeons discuss difficult treatment decisions with patients and their families. This story starts with your patient, Mr. Lombardi. Mr. Lombardi is an 81-year-old man with fulminant C. difficile colitis. He has a history of morbid obesity, hypertension, diabetes mellitus, stage 3 chronic kidney disease, and COPD on home oxygen. Two days ago, you started him on a trial of conservative management, but his white blood cell count has continued to rise, his kidneys are failing, and he has peritonitis on exam. Now, you need to talk to his family about his options. First, you must set the stage that this surgical problem is bad news. Patients and families need to understand that this event is unlikely to end well and could potentially result in his death. Even if he does survive, it's improbable he will be just as he was before. How can you be sure Mr. Lombardi's family understands his condition is grave? 
it is essential to clearly announce that he is very ill. You might say something like, I have some bad news. Your dad has a life-threatening problem. It is going to change his life. I worry he's going to die, even with surgery. I want to make sure you understand the options. Next, introduce the best case, worst case framework. Let's look at the graphic aid. To begin, identify which options you will present. In Mr. Lombardi's case, you're presenting two options, total colectomy and a non-surgical option, comfort care. For each option, draw a box and a star connected by a vertical line. The box represents the worst case outcome associated with a given treatment, and the star represents the best case outcome. Somewhere along this line lies the most likely outcome. Most likely may be close to or the same as the best case or worst case, or it could be somewhere in between. The idea is for you to combine your knowledge of the patient's overall health with your understanding of the current problem to give patients and families your best estimate of what is likely to happen. Telling a story is key. This helps patients imagine an unfamiliar experience so they can prepare and make decisions based on what is important to them. While surgeons often focus on providing precise risk calculation, these numbers don't help patients envision what it is actually like to have surgery. So, how can you explain the risks and benefits? By translating the statistics you know into stories. Instead of talking about a 20% risk of renal failure and a 35% risk of stroke, tell a story about what a patient's life might actually look like if these complications occurred. You show the probability of these events by where you position the most likely outcome on the line between best and worst. Pull out key elements from your story and write them on the graphic aid. During a busy day, this seems time-consuming, but it is critical. Patients and families will refer back to this graphic aid in order to deliberate about options after you have left. Let's get back to Mr. Lombardi. If you operate on him and everything goes really well, in your best-case scenario, what would his recovery be like? Would he be able to go home again? Tell the story. If everything goes well, he will have a big operation to remove his colon, and his stool will come out in a bag. Afterwards, he will be critically ill in the ICU for a number of days. He will need a breathing machine, and he won't be able to talk. In the best-case scenario, we would remove the breathing tube a few days after surgery, and he'd stay in the hospital for another week or so before going to a nursing home, where he'll have to work hard to regain his strength. If his luck continues, he may even be able to go home again, but he will be weaker, have a bag for his stool, and need a lot more help. Let's consider the worst-case scenario. For Mr. Lombardi, the worst case is clearly death after prolonged critical care. So in the worst case, he makes it through the surgery, but he returns to the ICU and is very sick. His post-operative course will be rocky. Maybe his kidneys won't recover and he will need dialysis. Maybe he'll be dependent on the ventilator to help him breathe. He will develop complications that he can't overcome. And ultimately, he never wakes up enough to talk and he dies in the ICU a few weeks after surgery. Patients often imagine the worst case scenario as dying in the operating room. It's important to explain what the worst case actually looks like, because a prolonged death in the ICU may be much more agonizing. Let's shift our attention to the most likely scenario. To illustrate this, put a mark somewhere along the vertical line to indicate where this outcome is located in relation to the best case and the worst case, which, for Mr. Lombardi, is down here. It's important to acknowledge the patient's baseline health and note that surgery will not help his underlying diabetes, lung disease, or mobility issues. Keeping this in mind, you say to Mr. Lombardi's family, most likely he'll survive surgery, but he will be pretty sick and in the ICU. He will need a breathing tube, especially because of his COPD, but we can get him out of the ICU after a week. He will likely suffer setbacks that will keep him in the hospital for another week or so. Ultimately, I think we can get him to a nursing home, but he will be much weaker and need a lot of nursing care. Surgery will be hard on him, 
and he was just barely making it before this happened. I don't think he will ever be independent again, and I expect that, even with surgery, he may only live a few more months. As physicians, we know that Mr. Lombardi's comorbidities and acute illness predict a nearly 70% one-year mortality. Best Case, Worst Case helps you translate your knowledge of this important statistic. Telling stories about the range of possible outcomes allows patients and families to visualize what might happen in a way that numbers alone cannot. Now repeat these same steps, describing the best case, worst case, and most likely outcomes for option number two. For Mr. Lombardi, this is comfort care. So you could say, in the best case, your father gets medicines to control his pain. He will die from this. I can't be sure when, but not right away. If we're lucky, there's time for everyone to gather and to say goodbye. I suspect he won't be able to carry on much conversation, but he may be able to respond in his own way, maybe squeeze your hand, and so on for the worst and most likely scenarios. Next, listen to what they say about the outcomes you just described. Ask them, how are you thinking about this? To reinforce this critical point, right at the bottom of the graphic aid, what is important to you now? If Mr. Lombardi's family simply says they want him to have surgery, that is not enough data. You might reply, okay, I'm glad you've come to a conclusion, but help me understand how you made that decision. How are you thinking about this? Access to this thought process is essential. When you know what is important to them, you can be sure that your recommendation is truly aligned with your patient's values and goals. Once you've elicited their preferences, the final step is to make a recommendation. It is not okay to simply present the options and expect your patients to choose. Your job is to match your knowledge about disease and treatment with their knowledge about what is valuable to the patient. Hopefully, after a conversation like the one I just demonstrated, Mr. Lombardi's family is able to tell you what he would think or say about the outcomes you described. Perhaps he fears being hooked up to a machine. Maybe you learn he is fiercely independent or that he never wanted to be on dialysis. Using this information, you could say, I understand that his independence is really important to him, and you already discussed his feelings about dialysis. I'm worried that even in the best case with surgery, he would still require several months in a nursing home. And, most likely, he will die before we can get him home. I think the outcome you're hoping for is not possible with surgery. And based on what I know about him, I recommend comfort care. Let's summarize. Best case, worst case has the following components. Break bad news. Identify two clear treatment options. Create a graphic aid that illustrates the range of outcomes and give it to your patient. You haven't done best case, worst case unless you complete this step. Use storytelling to describe the best, worst, and most likely outcomes. Avoid percentages and statistics. Include the patient's other medical problems in your story and how they will be affected by surgery and postoperative care. Describe how this will impact their overall survival and quality of life. Elicit preferences. Write, what is important to you now, on the graphic aid, and allow your patient adequate time to respond. Make a recommendation. So, what next? Many people hear about best case, worst case, and say, I already do that. I challenge you to go and try it this way. And then we've tried to streamline our intervention to, um, to allow for groups of trainees, whether they're residents or attending surgeons, to participate um, 
uh, without standardized patients and not with one-on-one -on -one training. And so that requires a training manual that teaches the learners to in part play a patient, in part do self-critique, and also teaches the trainers to evaluate, patient, uh, to evaluate the learners in multiple different spaces. And then finally, we have a checklist to try to um, secure the fidelity of our intervention. And so as part of this implementation package, which includes our video and this training manual and the instructor's manual, at the end there's an assessment with a checklist. And um, we sort of set the bar not super duper high. You have to get like 10 or 11 out of 15 to uh, show demonstrate competence. But it's both a learning tool and an assessment tool because it allows you to understand what the elements are. And it also allows you at the end to see say, well, after two hours, this is what we got. Um, you know, implementation science is actually not that interesting. It's kind of boring, and it has all these measures like reach and maintenance and adoption, which aren't half as interesting as efficacy. Um, and yet, I worry that we don't pay enough attention to it, especially as bioethicists, because we had all these brilliant ideas about how to support patient autonomy and how to care for them better, and somehow we just put it out there and let it fly and didn't really think about the consequences of doing that or how people would implement it in their day-to-day -day clinical practice. And I worry that some of this inattention to how things get done, even though you know the right thing to do, really ends up with some pretty impressive problems in healthcare. And so as much as I'm not like super inspired by implementation science, I think you fail the group that you want to help, whether it's patients, doctors, family members, or all of those people, without paying enough attention to it. So I'm trying to be a little bit of an implementation scientist. So um, I hope I left, yeah, I left about 12 minutes for questions. I just have to tell you that um, this looks like, you know, I enrolled 30 patients and taught these surgeons. It was a boatload of work, and I had a huge team of people helping me. Um, the first is Toby Campbell, who is a palliative care physician and um, thoracic uh, medical oncologist at UW. And um, honestly, if I could just inject everybody with a little bit of Toby Campbell, then I would be done because Toby just has this ability to talk to patients like nobody I have ever met. So best case, worst case is my effort to try and inject people with Toby Campbell. Um, the residents who helped me do this, I mean, they were like golden retrievers tracking down these patients. And um, this study is not doable without a surgical resident. And that's part of why I can't do it because it's really expensive <laughs> to hire a surgical resident on your research team. So, um, you know, as a surgeon and ethicist, you would think I have really thick skin. I, I, I don't. Um, so I'd be happy to take some questions, but please don't throw rocks or anything at me. Thank you. Larry. Thank you. To agree. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so you're, this is a study design choice. And we made a very intentional decision for this study to ask the surgeon before they went in to talk to the patient, do you think this patient has a choice between surgery and some other option? And I recognize that that is not every surgical decision. But what I didn't want to do is have a control group where um, that didn't look like the intervention group. And I didn't want to set the surgeons up to have to use this intervention that says, there's a choice, there are these two things, when they didn't think there was a choice. So we can talk about whether that was a good decision or a bad decision, but the reason I made that decision was to not set the surgeons up to use best case, worst case in a place where they didn't think it was appropriate. The second question is everybody wants to be in that few percent. So don't tell the surgeons. I don't think that this is going to stop a lot of unwanted surgery. What I think is going to happen is exactly what you said, is people will say, I'm hoping for the best case. Now, all of us would like to identify the people for whom best case scenario with surgery is not OK with them. That's really important with this tool. But I think the majority of people are going to look at this and say, I'm OK with best case scenario. But what's going to happen because you foreshadowed these other outcomes for them, most likely, and worst case, is that a few days down the road, they're going to say, wow, it's really looking a lot more like worst case the way you described it to me. It enables them to prepare. And the problem of the way we do it now is we sort of think of it as this isolated problem. You've got a hole in your colon, and we need to deal with that. And we know that when we take someone who's frail and old for their perforated diverticulitis, that they're not going to do well. 
But that's not how they've understood it. They've understood, I have this problem, and we're going to have this operation to fix it. But the way they do poorly is they have lots of subsequent events. And they don't recognize that the subsequent events are doing this to them. And by using best case, worst case, you can foreshadow that and enable them to prepare. And then the unwanted care that I actually really worry about is the stuff that happens after surgery, where they end up with a lot of treatments thinking, I'm just going to be exactly like I was before, because that's their goal, when that was never possible. So you're right. I mean, you could go and redraw the diagram, but I don't see anybody doing that. I do think it still helps. And I misspoke. I meant relational autonomy. I'm sorry. That's exactly what I meant. Yeah, they expect you, in your role as a physician, you have an obligation. And that obligation to participate in that decision is not to identify the choices and you cho choose. It's to hear from you what's important for you. That's your part. That's the patient's part of the side. And then to help them connect their preferences with what you know about the outcomes that are possible. And I think that, that we, we lose that all the time. And somehow, Surgeons have really understood informed consent. And I don't, I don't think it's unique to surgeons, honestly. But they sort of have this huge resistance to trying to help people decide. And I've heard many people say, you know, when people ask me what I would do when it's my father, they say, well, I'm not your father. You figure it out. And that's not the right response. The right response is, it sounds like you want a recommendation. And if they say yes, then you say, well, this is what I know about you, and this is what I would recommend. And you got to show your work about why you're recommending it. I like that. It's like, you know, long division. You know, this is what I recommend because X. But if you don't know enough about their, what's important to them, you have to say, I'd like to give you a recommendation, but I can't right now because I haven't figured out enough about what's important to you. When you say you just want to live, tell me what does that look like? What are you hoping for? What do you fear? And when you hear the answers to those questions, then you can say, wow, I really think we should do surgery. Because I think surgery might actually make you feel better. And that the quality of life you can have after surgery sounds very acceptable to you. Yeah. I, I, we, missed, uh, we missed that, I would say, as bioethicists. We sort of put informed consent out there and didn't sort of think through the subsequent consequences. I also have another beef with the bioethicists that I can talk about later. Well, but, but to be fair, um, and I think my feeling is that failure was to put it out there and not see what happened, what the consequences of it was. And I think that we had these wonderful ideas that I'm very supportive of, but we, you know, you, the problem with most of healthcare, whatever treatment that you're, you know, the RCT always looks awesome because those patients all look like each other and they're perfect and it's all just beautiful. But that's not how healthcare is practiced. And until you go out and see what's actually happening, what the consequences of that intervention is, then you actually don't know what you've done. And I worry that the bioethicists have not taken it upon themselves to sort of see how these great ideas worked out and then revise them in a way that might actually make it better. We have an opportunity to make it better. We just didn't do it. Tracy. So, uh, Yep, I know. I've spent a lot of time examining this issue for sure. And they don't like that. And part of me wants to say, oh, don't worry, that'll never happen if you use my thing, because that'll get me to have them use my thing. But really, that's a lot of different things all put together. And some of it is why surgery works, is that surgeons care so much about what happens to their patient, that the pa they don't want their patient to die. They feel personally responsible, and they take it in a very emotional way. And honestly, if you ask me, that's why surgery works, and that's what I want my surgeon to feel for me. I do think we could adjust a little bit, and I think this might even help, because when patients say, wow, that worst case scenario, that is something I do not want, I am not OK with being on a ventilator, that's a lot more information than they're getting right now. Because the information the surgeons are getting when they have this preoperative conversation and they've said the risks are this, 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 and this, is that those things are OK for the patient. That conversation just doesn't happen at all. And we've spent a lot of time looking at preoperative conversations, like watching a car accident. Everybody is on a different page. And it's not that the surgeons aren't doing a good job. They're great at informed consent. It's just that they haven't retranslated the information between each other about what's important to the patient and what surgery might have in store. And that is where these conversations go awry. We could also change some things about how we value what we do and 
having a chance to survive is really valuable to people. And I don't think we value that enough. And I also think that um, there are reasons to do operations that don't include just living for 30 days, and we probably don't count those things as much. Getting people out of pain, allowing them to talk to their family again, even just giving them a little more time to adjust with what's going on. Peter. Uh, so I, I think this is a really wonderful idea, and I really do think that it can Right, right. So this is the maintenance piece. So we actually surveyed surgeons at six months, at three months and six months with something called the Practitioner Opinion Survey. Um, almost 100%, we got a 92% response rate. Almost 100% said this was better than what they did before. And 72% said that they were still using it six months out. Do I think my colleagues are still using best case, worst case? I think that they have a few patients that they think, I need to use best case, worst case for this patient. And they will bring it out and they will use it. Honestly, I don't use it as much as I probably should. The patients really like it, and I think that it's valuable for them to have this thing to hold on to and sort of think about what these things are. People tell me that it takes too much time. Um, you know, we were talking about this in the car on the way over. I have never been to a surgical meeting where we decided to do extended lymphadenectomy or laparoscopic everything or stent every great vessel in your aorta and then put more stents down in the rest of your aorta and heard at the end some surgeons say that takes too much time. I don't have time for this. <laughs> I don't know why, if this improves quality of care and is better care, that is a reason. That it's a reasonable pushback. I don't think that's reasonable, and I think that what that reflects is either we don't value it enough, or we're not reimbursed for it. And maybe those things are the same. Maybe they're not. I get it. When I am on service, all I can do is just say, just book the next case. Just book the next case. It feels like I don't have time, but it does seem to me that maybe we just have our priorities messed up. I think if we felt like we had a little more time, that would help with maintenance. But I worry that maintenance isn't that great. I think the residents are better at this than the old surgeons. It's really hard to get old surgeons to change what they do. Yeah. Scal. That was a great talk. Thanks. Yeah, so Thank you. you mean having the palliative care doctor do the discussion? Right. Yeah. So, you know, as, as a surgeon, we, we tend to be very proud of ourselves and the ability to talk a patient into a surgery. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that is a bias. It's Absolutely. A bias. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we didn't switch the things. That wasn't the aim of our study. Obviously, I think there's a framing effect, and sure, you, it might be different. Um, so every time I give this talk, I get that question. And simultaneously, it pisses me off, and I think the person is right. So, um, so I mean, so this is the issue. There are people who are probably better at this than surgeons are. But honestly, if you just wanted to go and do technical things, you should have freaking gone into aerospace engineering. Because um, being a surgeon is about having a patient-doctor relationship. And there's certainly a piece of that relationship that's formed in the operating room. But that is different than the relationship you should form with the patient when you talk to them before surgery. And I think at least the surgeons I know and respect, they really care about that relationship. And so as much as I think there is value in outsourcing it to people who, like Toby, have spent years cultivating this really extraordinary way to talk to patients, um, you know, Toby's not there at 2 o'clock in the morning in the emergency room. And I hate the idea of outsourcing everything. Like, do we have to call ID every time we order antibiotics? Do we have to call cardiology every time we get an EKG? Do we have to call palliative care every time we have a difficult decision or we need to break bad news? It seems to me that there's like this baseline level of doctorness that we need to hold on to. And so as much as I think that there's a role for secondary palliative care, we need to learn some primary palliative care. Yeah, John. That was a great correction. Thank you. I wonder if you and Chris were looking at the same patient, would you mm. keep this in the same way? I mean, it's following up on yeah. the question about the palliative care doc yeah. and the surgeon. Uh -huh. To the extent that, you know, care of these patients is a team sport, yeah. that do different people do this differently? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we actually measured this. I didn't have time. I just selected the things I wanted to show you. Um, 
So, um, so we have a paper coming out in Journal of Pain and Symptom Management next month, I think, that wherein we did the standardized patients with the surgeons, we were able to look at the variability based on a standardized patient. So the surgeons got the same uh, vignette, um, and then we tried to see how variable they were with best case, with worst case. Um, we actually found more variability in the operation they offered than in the outcomes they <laughs> described. So the vascular surgeons, they would offer like amputation and you know, like all this stuff. They had all these different ideas. Um, but actually the outcomes of best, worst, and most likely are pretty similar. And the GI surgeons had uh, similar, um, you know, they just had different approaches, but the stories they told about what the outcomes were actually didn't have as much var intra-surgeon variability. So it's always really um, a little disconcerting when you think about going to do this, like how do you tell the story? Like how do you know what story to tell? I have this really great friend named Eric Widera who's a palliative care doctor at UCSF and he says, is worst case scenario when a meteor hits the hospital? I mean, you could imagine you could tell a lot of different stories and you could tell the best case scenario that is probably not possible for the patient. But the idea is not to, pick, to, to predict the future. The idea is to tell a story that allows the patient to imagine what might happen, but also see all of the interconnected parts so they can anticipate and prepare, and then make the decision in the setting of this sort of longitudinal understanding of what is possible. Um, it's hard. It's, it's hard and it takes some work. And honestly, um, now that we're trying to train the nephrologists to do this, I'm really realizing it was actually pretty easy to train the surgeons in comparison. It's hard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to start with a disclaimer that I'm a primary care physician. So awesome. I'm Yeah, so there's a group at Memorial Sloan Kettering and the guy's name there is Levine. And he uses best case, worst case more like a ruler as opposed to a decision tree. I like that idea. I think it's really, you know, people are always looking for a prognosis, particularly people with cancer. But I think you're right, probably people with chronic illness. I don't know that people with chronic illness are looking for a prognosis, but they probably would do well to get some sort of prognostic information because that would help them plan. And it would probably inform their decision a little bit more. But we're super loath to give any prognostic information because obviously we don't want to be wrong. And what best case, worst case allows you to do is say, I don't actually know what's going to happen to you, but these are the stories I might tell. And that I think is really helpful to patients because then they can start to sort of understand the range of what's possible and then even get a sense of how the other things that they know about themselves would play out under those um, conditions. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to hear if you tried it. <laughs> yeah, awesome. So great. Thank you very much.